Welcome back and I hope you're ready for more because today we're counting down the top 10 unusual medieval laws you never knew existed part 2. Let's go. Slander is number 10. Imagine seeing some random dude in the market square holding his nose and shouting about how he was a liar. Honestly, wasn't weird under the Norman law from 1066 to 1154. If you committed the act of slander, on top of paying damages to those whose reputation you may have affected, you also had to do the holding of the nose. This law was enacted by Pouty, first king of Norman who had spent his whole life on the throne being called William the Bastard for his parents' unmarried status. In return, he exacted this silly law that required the slanderer to stand in the center of town as previously described, holding their nose and shouting about their lies. Public humiliation has long since been an effective means of preventing crime. And just about anything. Number 9 is Jenny cragging it. Edward III of England was so tired of his royal court nobility being heavier set that he made an entire law about it. In 1336, the new law stated obesity made people not able to aid themselves nor their liege lord in times of need. Edward mandated a maximum belt size and also, if you watched part 1, implemented food restrictions, banning more than two courses with the exception of holy days. Edward even defined soup as a separate course to prevent people from calling that a sauce or a condiment. This law lasted remarkably until 1856. Its main purpose in the long run had likely become beneficial economically to ensure that England's resources could be employed more effectively in the upcoming war with the French. Still, regardless, he seems like a fat shaming dude. German purity law is number 8. Beer is Germany's national drink, and that's nothing new. The Germans have been indulging for thousands of years. Typically, beer was produced in groups and always made of pure grain, until the purity law is made by Wilhelm IV in 1516 Bavaria. Germans, and most people of the medieval and middle ages, didn't drink water as it was often deeply contaminated. They drank beer. The law imposed was aimed at preventing crops used to make bread from being squandered on brewing, so it stipulates that only water, barley, and hops were allowed to be used as key ingredients for beer production. At first, brewers thought this was ludicrous and unusual to decide, but it turns out Wilhelm was actually onto something with this combination. This original law went on to become the core of German beer purity laws that affect German brewing to this day, which makes them the oldest regulations related to food and drink in the world. The only change to it in recent in history was the adding of yeast. The Brewers Association of Germany wants the 5th century old law governing how German beer is made to become part of the UNESCO World Heritage List. It would join the Argentinian tango, Iranian carpet weaving, and French gastronomy, among other famous traditions that are considered unique and worth protecting. Let's talk sumptuary laws with the Spanish garment laws, number 7 in the countdown. Sumptuary laws, which we discussed in part 1, are placed in to control the nobility and their consumption and displays of of material goods. In the case of Spain, there are many sumptuary laws in place as early as the Spartan era. In the 13th century, for example, Siena passed a provision reducing the trains on women's dresses, which was a direct effort to curb a purely aristocratic style. In 1356, the city of Florence proclaimed it illegal for women to have buttons on their clothing without a corresponding buttonhole. And also, no one other than the king was legally permitted to wear a scarlet rain cape. Also in Florence, it was studied how sumptuary legislation around fashion served as a tool to encourage marriage in a society where excessive extravagance of men providing clothing for the women and their families exasperated the custom of very expensive dowries. If her standards were already up, you had to work harder to pay for her, I guess. And a delay in marriage did mean a dip in population. While there are ample examples of the laws themselves, similar to many other sumptuary laws, there's virtually no record of their enforcements or punishments. Oftentimes this is because nobility themselves violated their own laws that they made for themselves. Without evidence of how exactly these laws were enforced or whether they were enforced at all, it remains extremely difficult to discuss their social impact, the attitude civilians had towards them as well. Did they act accordingly so as not to face legal difficulties or the payment of fines? Who knows? Not us. So on to the next. Refusing knighthood comes in at number 6. This law was put into place in 1233. Why you may ask? Because simply put, being a knight sucked. If you saw our last video, you may remember hearing about how insanely taxed knights were, but on top of that you had to pay for a ton of mandatory clothes, train incessantly, pay the king for serving him, and don't forget the custom sized armor. You lose or gain weight, you're gonna have to pay to replace whole pieces. That's on top of the potential of dying in a battle you just don't care for. No, not many people wanted to be a knight. Roger of Dudley refused to attend his own knighting when he learned he'd have to pay for it. In response to his refusal, Henry III on the spot passed a law against refusing the knighthood. He forcefully knighted Dudley and also confiscated his land to boot. Yikes. Number 
five is the legal protection of claiming sanctuary. Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame depicts an iconic scene of Quasimodo swinging around on rope dramatically over the burning base of the Notre. Having just saved Esmeralda from an execution, he holds her aloft in the cathedral's turrets and screams out sanctuary. Sanctuary actually predates Christianity and originates far back into the 300s and existed until the 16th century. Every medieval law folded to the protections of sanctuary no matter the criminal's crime. Now, sanctuary seeking criminals might have been required to perform penance or go into exile, but they were at least guaranteed immunity from punishment. That's right, you could literally strangle someone and then run to the church to claim sanctuary and no one could come in and harm, arrest, or remove you for punishment. Sanctuary was abolished due to the new tide of judicial law and the arguments of crime, power, and punishment. Also because people should be punished for, I don't know, maybe taking someone else's life. Originally, before Christianity, it was temples such as the ones in Greek and Rome offering the solace, and it was part of the Roman law by the end of the 4th century to have it. Christianity adopted this practice to try and persuade people to join their religion when it started. Even after the Western Roman Empire fell in 476, churches maintained their authority to protect people who had broken major secular laws. Number 4, let's meet the Yellow Ladies. Venice, Italy was an important trading post. Many people came and went, many travelers came to see the great city. But for those who had been at sea for a while, they may have wanted to see a little something else. As a result, medieval Venice was a massive red light district, enjoyed by many before their next voyages. Trying to control the number of ladies working the streets, the Venetian government mandated in 1360 that brothels must be concentrated in the market and port districts. Obviously that just made their industry boom more since it was concentrated right where all the money came in and not dispersed, requiring men to travel farther out in convenient ways. Angry now that they weren't at least getting to capitalize off the potential tax revenue of these women, they in 1420 decided to be accommodative of their lady of the night friends, the Venetian government accommodated more red light districts and implemented safety means within them, as well as the law of yellow. All women of the trade were to wear shades of yellow so as to be identifiable to their clientele, so random ladies just out on a stroll who happen to be in the area don't get harassed. But also it's a little bit of that classic shame tactic of making someone unwanted easily identifiable for discrimination. Number 3 is the indigenous sumptuaries of Spain. As early as 1501, the crown warned natives who carried sword, dagger, or any other weapons that they face confiscation and may be condemned to more punishments according to what the court sees fit. Spanish restrictions against natives developed through the 16th century. This mandate is no surprise as these items, while dangerous, complemented and enhanced men's fashions, and fashionable repairs became integral to everyday masculine attire in Europe. To the indigenous, they had been items of necessity to carry and often seen as symbolic. For indigenous men of the elite, the right to bear arms highlighted much more than their privileged status the way that it did for the colonizer. It demonstrated colonial acknowledgement of their once dominant standing on their original lands and partially vindicated their marginalized reality even as a royal. June 8, 1685, Don Diego Garcia, an indigenous leader of what's now Guerrero, had petitioned to the Viceroy of New Spain to intervene on his behalf when this sumptuary denied him the right his parents, grandparents, and ancestors had always possessed. Garcia was one of 505 petitions submitted by 277 towns between 1575 and 1693 demanding change. In response to a perceived disregard for the law, the monarchy reissued the restriction six more times over the course of the next 70 years. The items requested by Don Diego Garcia reflected both indigenous and European definitions of masculinity. By focusing on European attire and the personal weapons, Garcia took advantage of the social currency imposed by Spanish colonizers. As an elite, Garcia faced decreased political power and increased marginalization under a new regime. Garments and swords provided the ability to visually assert himself in everyday life. Ultimately, petitions submitted by Garcia and his peers reflected not just a request for special status items, but an attempt to assert their belonging as an elite man in a colonial life. Number two is just absurd, but you can club a Swede. If they cross the frozen sea between Denmark and Sweden. What? This unusual law was imposed during the Dano-Swedish Wars of 1657 to 58. King Charles Gustav of Sweden had been planning to cross the Orsund by ship, but the freezing temperatures of January changed that plan. Frozen solid, the Swedes realized that they could simply just walk across. This completely caught the Danes off guard as no attack had been predicted until the spring and they scrambled to compensate. Ultimately, the Danes signed the Treaty of Rockskild and yielded to the territory dispute. But ever since that day, should you see a 
Swede crossing over the frozen sea on foot, you are legally free to swing a big old club at him. And finally, at number one, you either tuck it or you lose it. Medieval Wales was not playing around when it came to women being violated. If you were caught or perpetrator of this heinous crime, your options were to pay a dowry or get the little man chopped off. That's right, a violation such as this was actually considered a theft and was treated as such by the law. Should a perp pay the dowry, then legally the woman's virginity or body was restored in legal parameters. Can't or won't pay the fine? Well then, that was the end of down there for you. The reason for this, other than it being morally right, is that the fines and punishments hope to stop families from developing harmful feuds which would damage the wider society as a whole. This was not exclusive to Wales, however. This punishment shows up in the 1750s code of Constinian Marvodokot in Eastern Europe. It was not unheard of for women to also simply just take the law into their hands either. In a rural area of Shropshire near the Welsh border in 1405, Isabella Grawernus and her two daughters ambushed her, attacked her in a field, tied him up and did the dreaded snip snip and stole his horses to boot. All three women were subsequently pardoned. Alright well I hope you guys enjoyed part 2 and if you want to see more be sure to like and subscribe, comment down below what you'd love to learn about and I will see you next time.